microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the first week of June 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio, and when censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does in fact seem to be an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoke. Our format, it's a little new, will be to take turns introducing a topic or a comment or an outrage of the week, uh, which the others will then have a chance to comment on or raise a question about. And we'll try to have several rounds. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, Either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. So you're watching News from Neptune, the lightning round edition. <laughs> Today is Friday, June 10th, 2011, a day of deja vu, just amazing stories on this day. In 1805, Pasha Yusuf Karamanli, signed the treaty ending the hostility between his city-state of, wait for it, Tripoli and the United States. Uh, the story is worth digging out. Uh, during the uh, administration of Thomas Jefferson, the U.S. sent a mercenary army to kill the leader of uh, the city-state of Tripoli, uh, who had been so uh, egregious as to cut down an American flag and uh, capture an American 36-gun uh, frigate, by the way. Um, it, uh, the war went badly. It was supposed to be over in a moment, uh, and things went on for a good while. Uh, on this day in 1805, a peace treaty was finally uh, signed between the ruler of Tripoli and the United States of America. Uh, today comes news that the ruler of Tripoli today, Muammar Gaddafi, has written directly to the Senate, the House, and the President of the United States uh, offering to sign a peace treaty, offering to declare a, a ceasefire, plus sa change. Uh, on this day in 1999, uh, the U.S. and NATO, and, and NATO is uh, sort of like um, Igor to America's Dr. Frankenstein here, you know, the. Uh, big dumb guy who does what he's told. Uh, U.S. and NATO stopped two and a half months of bombing of Serbia. I think we're going to hear some more about Serbia from David. Um, after Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic agreed to withdraw Serbian forces from Kosovo. This has been mythologized all out of, uh, I mean, what's part of, we were protecting civilians in Serbia just as we are in Tripoli. Right. Lies, absolute lies, both times, and it's worthwhile to find out f why. And finally, on this day in 1935, Dr. Robert Smith took his last drink. An Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in Akron, Ohio by him and Bill Wilson. Uh, this is important because uh, it seems to me that we have here a model for um, uh, what is really an issue of public policy. We got this past week the results of an international commission uh, pointing out uh, the uh, serious wrongs of one of the most repressive and racist policies followed by the United States government domestically, that is the war on drugs. Uh, prohibition was, is a bad idea in both cases, uh, and uh, dealing with real medical problems is an important one. Alcoholics Anonymous has a remarkable record in this regard. Uh, our mentor, Noam Chomsky, says there's a good reason why nobody studies history. It just teaches you too much. So we'll go now to the uh, first of our lightning rounds, starting with Ronzo. Yes, I want to uh, raise a point uh, with uh, several aspects, perhaps. Uh, I'll call it uh, Keep the Faith, uh, pep talks being given by uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, uh, yes. who has uh, scolded 
the other members of NATO, the European uh, nations, for any, in essence, not being sufficiently militaristic. Mm. And uh, he has uh, told them, uh, he has issued them a dire warning, according to this piece by Tom Shanker in the New York Times, that uh, the United States, the, the traditional leader, there's that word again, mm. and bankroller of the alliance, is exhausted by a decade of war and its own mounting budget deficits and simply may not see NATO as worth supporting any longer. And uh, this is supposed to be a, uh, uh, a bad omen uh, for them. He wants them to uh, step up and uh, bear the expense of their own uh, defense. But uh, uh, again, uh, they're being told to keep the faith that uh, some uh, point is there uh, that needs defending in uh, NATO. Many people have been saying that NATO actually lost its point, its rationale, uh, a decade or two ago, and uh, is looking for some some uh, reason to exist now. Uh, so Gates criticized NATO nations for failing to meet their commitments in Afghanistan or for imposing sweeping restrictions on the forces that they do send, which he said hobbled the effort. So uh, uh, get with it, uh, European nations. Uh, we have lots of fighting to do yet. Uh, more nations to uh, bomb and invade and conquer and uh, get with the program, okay? Co uh, comment or question, David? Well, what, what is it? Um, it seems like in the case of Libya, France and Italy have more of a dog in this fight, mm -hmm. and why and is that resulting in um, in their uh, willingness to con con you know, con contribute more to to NATO, and how is that affecting uh, the? It, it, you know, it's a perhaps a too technical question, but just to raise that that issue, it seems like Libya has changed something about about that. Uh, Libya, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm reminded of this uh, other thing that came out in time. Uh, bankruptcy, but a bonanza in post-Gaddafi Libya in uh, time. And uh, could this be part of an effort to persuade these other countries that uh, it's worthwhile to uh, fight and uh, conquer uh, there? Because there are some goodies in prospect if they stay with the effort. Yeah, it seems to me that the NATO thing, um, and you're absolutely right, Ron, that this is uh, central uh, to the, what the U.S. is doing abroad in its relationship with uh, the uh, European Union. NATO was a lie from the beginning. I mean, NATO was supposed to be an alliance that stopped the Russian hordes from descending on Western Europe. It was a North Atlantic treaty that would hold back the tremendous uh, attempt of the Russians to conquer everything to Topeka. The picture was thousands of Russian tanks coming in from the east and sweeping across Europe. Exactly. And uh, the, it, it overlooked facts like the uh, uh, half of the mechanized divisions of the Soviet Army in 1945 were horse-drawn. That was a mechanized division in the Russian army. The uh, Russians, after all, had lost 11 million people in the, in, you know, in the war. Russia was destroyed. Uh, the United States, as the only undamaged from the, uh, um, country from the Second World War, the, what the U.S. was worried about was that the model of, a Soviet of the Soviet Union, however badly it had been done for a generation, the model going back to 1917, you know, of a society supposedly run for and by the working class, that that would have some purchase in Western Europe, as indeed it did. Uh, what we were concerned about was socialism, uh, not tanks. Uh, and uh, the way to deal with that, at home and abroad, by the way, uh, was to say, oh, we've got to be ready for war. And therefore, the United States went so far as to put weapons caches around Europe uh, in case there should be popular uprisings. Uh, we also subverted governments like the Italian government, for example, uh, when it looked like uh, progressive elements would, uh, would take a role in that. NATO was part of this strategy. Uh, the, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, uh, therefore you've got to do what we say and organize your economy and so forth this way. And I'm struck by t today we get this NATO talk from Gates uh, at the same time, and I saw this in the British papers, not in the American papers, uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner 
Geithner uh, is, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is, is busily telling the Europeans, hey, none of the regulation stuff, you can't talk to companies that way. You've got to put a regulation, you know, the financial regulation regime in like ours, not the sort of stuff you're talking about, which is going to uh, cripple companies, particularly American companies, uh, in Europe. So, I mean, the, the Europeans are being given their march marching orders militarily by Gates, economically by Geithner, and it's no accident it's happened, you know, sort of at the same time. I mean, uh, you know, there's only so many players in this game. I guess my, my question would be, insofar as the U United Nations has evolved in sort of the diplomatic arm of the U.S. and w Western Europe, and the U.N. has engaged in military actions and, 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 and enlisted forces for military actions, but in one sense is Na has NATO basically become the military arm of the U United Nations? Yeah. Yeah, ah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Remember in 99 uh, when Clinton decided that the Serbians were getting uppity, uh, he had help in deciding that, but still, um, <laughs> there was never any talk of going to the United Nations for a Security Council resolution. No, no, uh, it was it considered an attack on one as an attack on all, and the Serbians had attacked NATO by running a different sort of economy. Uh, they hadn't uh, instituted the neoliberal reforms of the sort that Geithner is calling for in 1999. Therefore, they had to be attacked. Now, at the time, it was all put in terms of protecting civilians, the brave people of Kosovo who were being attacked. But all of that turned out to be nonsense, as the Clinton people said a few years later, when they said the problem was that the uh, uh, Serbians were not instituting the economic reforms uh, that uh, the European Union in general wanted. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, you have a, a Serbian uh, theme that you wanted to mention here, right? Did David? you want me to go forward with yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead with that? Well, I guess w one of the things that's inspiring this general topic uh, w wasn't, as, wasn't the Serbian theme, but, but related, and that is just the, the kind of accusations that get thrown around in war by the pro propaganda min, 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 pro propaganda min, ministries of of our of our country. Um, yesterday, we heard Amy Goodman, and I think it was particularly interesting that she would report this: that the judge at the International Criminal Court accused accused Gaddafi of offering of yeah. offering Vi Viagra to his troops in oh, order or to his okay. soldiers in order to rape to rape women. Um, and it, first of all, it strikes me that it's ta taboo to raise any issues with this. And let me do a sort of a disclaimer by saying that um, these are serious issues. War is a serious issue. Sex sexism, homophobia, and everything like that are serious issues. But I can't think of a more cynical use of what, what we call ident identity politics than to bring the issue of rape into, into war, um, into the midst of all the controversies about our prosecution of this war, apparently on any, in any evidence whatsoever that can, that can be shown, even though it's being offered by the of official and respected quote unquote source of the International Criminal Court. And, um, and this leads me to just a brief uh, a brief detour into this sort of general area of how notions of genocide and so forth are used. We've talked about this before on this on this program. And there was an article on antiwar.com, which is the libertarian antiwar website, um, a week ago, or on, on June 3rd, actually, by someone who's been writing for them for some for quite some time, a Serb named Named, I hope I'm getting this right, Nebojša Malić, and he wrote an article called "Conjuring the Black Hat," subsequent to the arrest of Ratko, Ratko Milad, Miladžić, and all of the sort of customary rhetoric that went back at, that 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 was sub subsequent to this to his um, to his. Uh, uh, app apprehension by the internet by the aforementioned International Criminal Court. Um, he writes 
uh, one of his subheadings that he writes about this is called the five day hate fest and he wrote the media the media feeding frenzy in the five days between Gen general general Balaji's ar uh, 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 you know, arrest and his and his ren rendition on on Monday resembled nothing so much as the similar outpouring of vitriol almost three years ago during the arrest and ren rendition of former Bosnian Serb President Radovan Karadzic. It, has, it had been a rare moment when, when Islamic militant joins hands with liberal interventionists and hated their common villain. Um, and uh, Malich goes on in this, in this uh, article uh, I'll just read one, a couple more sentences from it. Um, the sort of hysterical hyperbole used to describe the events of the Bosnian War, the, the, the e Egyptian judge who wrote Malaj's original indictment in 1995 claimed that, quote, children were killed before their, their mother's eyes, a grandfather forced to eat, eat, the, eat, eat, the, eat the liver of his own grandson, end quote. Uh, does a colossal disservice to its actual victims. The horrors of war were quite ghastly enough on their own. Embellished to the point of snuff fiction, they morph into myth and fuel the, the flames of hatred. Perhaps this is why Bosnia is still mentally at war 15 years after the guns fell silent. Hmm. Uh, question or comment, Ron? Um, what do you make of this uh, supposed uh, hero worship of uh, Mladic in uh, uh, Serbia? Uh, do the Serbs have some kind of perennial psychological problem about their status in Europe or in the world or, or whatever? And uh, how does that contribute to this? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, as, you know, as people, people are always said about, about Nixon, uh, when you know when people call him par par paranoid and and people say no people really do hate him right. yeah. but, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean the Serbs to me have gotten a pretty raw deal yeah. since yeah. the death of Tito and as Carl mentioned before they became the whipping boy for their their failure to sort of join the the international neo neoliberal cons cons consensus right. and and play ball with the yeah. EU and with the U U U U with the U United Nations, and um, undoubtedly this has resulted in some bad bad behavior by some of their leaders. But when re when one really reads the record closely, whether it's about about Mil Milosevic or in this article about Mil you know you know Milosevic, I won't speak to Kar Kar uh, to Kar Karadzic. I haven't really, I haven't really researched all that. Much. One finds that that it, it isn't just that that less is there than meets the eye in regards to what Serb was actually guilty of, but it's the the kind of lurid language and the and yes. the and the and the, and the inf, you know inf, inflated charges that go along with attempting to cast these men in the role of Adolf Hitler. Yeah, yeah. It was the, 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 the American attack on Serbia, um, NATO attack, and NATO and inverted commas here, because of course it's the U.S. as we've been saying, um, has I think gone down the memory hole, but it's very much uh, uh, a model for what the Obama administration is doing in Libya right now. I mean, up to and including using Libya and air power and the whole thing. Uh, what Clinton did in 99 is the playbook that they're using. And as we find in American foreign policy, back to Jefferson time, that it learns little and forgets little. Uh, and it seems to me that the Serbian example is very worthwhile here, mainly for what it tells us about the United States. Doesn't uh, the, the demonization of Serbia and Serbs was so great that uh, it doesn't tell us much about Serbia until we deconstruct some of that demonization. But the situation itself was really quite remarkable. I mean, Americans were told that, oh, you look, uh, terrible things are happening to civilians in a place called Kos Kosovo, so we've got to bomb it. And Clinton went on television and gave one of the most remarkably uh, facetious speeches uh, in a long time. In fact, I think 
the article, the one article, the newspaper article that I've written over the years that has been most reprinted was a parody of Clinton's speech announcing the bombing of Serbia entitled, Japan Bombs New Mexico. And it purported to be a speech by the Japanese Prime Minister telling why it became regrettably necessary to bomb New Mexico. You know, and it was exactly, it was Clinton's speech with just some of the names changed, you know. Um, now, what actually happened in Serbia, what Clinton actually did, and it is the paradigm case of humanitarian intervention, is something that would be very worthwhile to sort out because it's being used right now by the president administration. Uh, and, and one of the best places to start is with one of the, one of the books by our own uh, tutelary deity here, Noam Chomsky, um, writing about humanitarian intervention in Serbia. Uh, and the place to, to start is the admission by Clinton administration officials after the fact that the real purpose of the war had nothing to do with concern for people in Kosovo. It was because Serbia was not carrying out the required social and economic reforms, meaning it was the last corner of Europe which had not subordinated itself to US-run neoliberal organization of the European economy, and therefore it had to be eliminated. And that's, uh, that's exactly what Clinton people said after the fact. Now, I'm old enough to remember people in the economics department talking about the Illyrian model, and meaning Yugoslavia, uh, in the 1960s. Unco liber American liberals uncomfortable about the Illyrian model because here it looked like a socialism that might work. We can't have that. Uh, I guess what the point I'd make subsequent to that is that what, what really concerns me at another level is that there seems to be a special place in liberal discourse even though many liberals and many people we call pro, you know, progressives would claim to understand the, the lies of U.S. foreign policy, that there seems to be always a little place set aside to sort of, to sort of still evoke Hitler, evoke oh, yeah. genocide, mm -hmm. evoke baby killing, evoke rape in the context of those places in which it can be seen, in which it is arguable that there is still, there are still times when we can quote unquote do good, that mm -hmm. when America can right. still represent what it allegedly is supposed to rep represent in the world, and that, and that no matter how many countries we invade Ill illegally, immorally, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, so forth, that there's still a place reserved in the liberal mind for these opportunities to do good. And the argument is always the same. The argument is that just because we do bad some of the time doesn't mean that we shouldn't do good when we have the opportunity to do so. And Libya is another case yeah. of this. And, and the, the kind of rhetoric follows with these ac accusations of, of, of rape. And these, I mean, what, what must be said are absurd when you think about it, I mean, the, the, the idea that Amy Goodman would read on her morning newscast, blandly read, that it's being asserted by the International Criminal Court that, that Gaddafi is, is off, offering, offering, vi, offering lifestyle drugs to his, to his troops um, really shouldn't pass. But at the same time, again, it's the kind of thing that almost can't be responded to. The nature of it is that if you do respond to it, you put yourself in the place of, of, of um, soft peddling, uh, apparently, uh, what might be very horrible things. And this story was all over the BBC, too. It wasn't just, you know, democracy yeah. down and put it on. And it, it, it goes so. back about six weeks. I, I Googled yep. it, and actually Su Su Susan Rice was, was making this. Of uh, all people. This tape in, in, late, in late April. Yep. Exactly. Uh, Susan Rice is the wretched American representative to the UN, uh, uh, the one who uh, claimed uh, at the outset of the Obama administration that the Bush administration's drone attacks on Pakistan were just baby steps and that her administration, meaning the Obama administration, would do much better than that. And indeed they have. They made a lot of babies who were you know, unable to take any steps at all.
Yeah, uh, I think there should be rec some recognition here of the special place that accusations by sexual misdeeds have in uh, all propaganda. Uh, it's a uh, extremely uh, <laughs> As Congressman potent Weiner theme. Says, yes, yes, right. <laughs> and uh, some uh, uh, accusation of uh, sexual uh, deviation or excess or something always seems to get into the uh, picture somehow. And uh, I think it tells you something about our culture and our obsession and uh, tension and uh, uh, anxiety about certain kinds of themes uh, concerning uh, sexuality. But uh, somehow it always seems to get turned into that. And uh, I, I, I don't think it's a healthy tendency, but there it is. And it's, we, we, we're becoming dangerously psychoanalytic here. And yes, I right, right. No, no, no. I mean, I, I think your point is very well taken, Ron. Yeah. I agree with it entirely. And it may, leads me to raise a point. Sorry. Oh, God. See, that you cannot. <laughs> the Anthony Once Weiner. Once the innuendo starts, well, it exactly. can't stop. Well, right. exactly. They're unavoidable. They're right. absolutely unavoidable. Right. But did you see what Amy Goodman I won't even say anything about her name. What Amy Goodman wrote this week about Congressman Weiner, uh -huh. about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the article she wrote. And so help me, the title of it, maybe she didn't give it the title, but Weiner is no Longfellow. <laughs> now, yeah. maybe, maybe, you know, yeah. we're all, we've all gone mad and there's no way to do anything except say, uh, to back to the serious question, yeah. not that this isn't a serious question, of the model of the war. Uh, I can recommend again, I've mentioned it before, the, uh, what to my mind was an absolutely brilliant piece by Nicholson Baker in the May Atlantic, uh, entitled, the, or subtitled at least, The Myth of the Good War, which takes up just your point, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, David, about, you know, well, we've got to stop Hitler after all. Well, and, uh, it wasn't the Atlantic, it was Harper's, right? Oh, sorry, it, was, it certainly yes. wasn't the Atlantic, it was right, Harper's, right, you're right. quite right. Uh, right. Very different, very different uh, yeah. uh, magazines. Harper's, the May Harper's, Nicholson Baker, uh, his book, uh, which is in some sense uh, the, the background of the article, uh, A Human Smoke, I thought was an amazing and an important book, and he draws some of the lessons of it, so to speak, in this article uh, on just this point of, uh, after all, we had to stop Hitler. Yeah. But uh, I actually wanted to say, because this sort of relates to something else I'd written down here, um, I made a note. There was a, a book review in the New York Times a Sunday paper a, a week ago, Sunday or two, almost two weeks ago. Uh, you, I'm, you, I'm sure you noticed it, uh, a book review by a guy named Adam Kirsch. And it was a review of various books about the Good War. Oh, yes. And, yes. and, and I, one of the people mentioned was Nicholson Baker, right. of course, although Look, only in passing. I, but I, I, I really wanted to set you up and glob you a big <laughs> softball <laughs> in regard to that, that review, although it's an interesting piece yeah, of work. It the, is, and indeed, and it's worth talking about. I, look, I contend... Look, looking when I saw that, I said this is a direct response to Nicholson Baker. As you say, he's only mentioned in the concluding paragraphs. Absolutely. But the reason that that article is there is Baker's piece in the in the Harper's, uh, and it, it, there was just there's enough time to do that. And the uh, Sam Tannenhaus, who edits who edits uh, uh, the New York Times Book Review, is very sensitive to things like that. There's a political subtext to what he does all the time from uh, basically the neocon uh, uh, neocon position. And that article, uh, an, an informed, an intelligent one, but still in all, that's the politics of war party politics. And they put that in there. I am sure someone rushed in the office and said, "My God, we got to do something." about this thing of Nicholson Baker's, and, her, and Kirsch's thing was the response. Uh, you are watching News from Neptune, uh, the lightning round edition. Uh, we are, are trying a slightly new uh, uh, format, uh, and uh, I, since I've had uh, my innings here, I think maybe we should go back to Ron Zoak, and uh, you, get, you get a second serve, Ron. Yes, uh, part two. Uh, uh, <laughs> Whether it's 40, 40, 40 love or not. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the, back to uh, love. Yeah, yeah the uh, question of uh, pep talks uh, to people to keep the faith. Headline, nominee tells Senate panel Afghan war is not hopeless. Oh, yes. Um, so this is the uh, hearing for before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee of Ryan Crocker, who's been nominated to be our uh, ambassador to Afghanistan. And he's telling the Senate, despite this report that came out, pointing to massive corruption and uh, uh, incompetence in uh, Afghanistan, that uh, we could not 
we cannot afford to walk away anytime soon. More and more people are concluding, I think, that we can't afford not to walk away sometime soon. Mm. But uh, mm -hmm. he is well, giving yeah. lectures about uh, uh, this backdrop of steadily rising public concern over the high costs of the 10-year-old war. Too much money spent with too little oversight has fueled corruption and waste, the report said. This is the Senate report. For example, one program authorizes the payment of up to $100,000 a month to Afghan provincial leaders for local projects, a tidal wave of funding that can be difficult to efficiently and fairly absorb, it says. Foreign and military, foreign military and development funds now account for such an overwhelming share of the Afghan economy, equivalent to 97%, if it's gross economic prod, uh, product, by one estimate, there's, there's a real possibility of a severe economic depression when foreign troops leave, according to the report. <laughs> so, uh, hey, where most of their GDP, for God's sake. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, Mr. Crocker, again, is saying, uh, hang in there, uh, keep the faith, uh, uh, don't be discouraged, uh, we must keep fighting on and on and on, even though uh, it looks uh, hopeless because uh, it's uh, not really hopeless and we can't afford to walk away uh, anytime soon. What does that say about uh, Mr. Crocker, about the uh, Senate, and about the American public? Uh, uh, do you see a wave of disillusionment about Afghanistan? David, you want to crack it down? Well, I think the polls certainly show that. Yeah. The public, the, the broad, there's a broad dis dis disillusionment with the war in Afghanistan. And I think what what keeps it from what keep you know what keeps it from going any further outside of the fact that just the people who run this country do what they want is that there's still this sort of um, there's avoiding avoiding an understanding that we're not there for the reasons that yeah. are claimed that we are there, so that it doesn't really make any difference that Osama bin Laden has been has been killed. Um, we still have the same reasons for being there, so it, it appears to me that there is this there is this sort of crosstalk going on where, on the one hand, we acknowledge that progress was made with the death of Osama bin Laden, but that there still is this other there is this there is this war being fought for very different reasons, and the public. I mean, I think. As, as much as anything else, the public can't unite around a an a, an opposition to the war because they they continue to be con, con, you know confused about why we're we're really there. It really comes down to the fact that they see this money being spent uh, over there instead of over mm -hmm. instead of over over here, but they're they're not necessarily understanding why it is we're we're over there. But yeah. you speak delicately, David, avoiding the understanding, uh, you know, is another way of saying accepting the Obama administration's lies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's that's what's happening. And one of the things that's happening sort of sub rosa here is a remarkable illustration of how undemocratic uh, American uh, government actually is. We have 70 percent, perhaps, of Americans now saying there's something wrong with this war and we really shouldn't be there. Uh, Seventy percent of the Congress, however, says we got to be there. Right. I mean, uh, there are good liberal friends of ours who are saying, isn't it wonderful that we may have almost as much as a quarter of the Congress saying what 70% of the Americans are saying, we shouldn't be there. Now, that offset is, is, is very serious indeed. Uh, and that's, you know, in some sense, the political problem we're dealing with in the war. Uh, the, the popular understanding uh, is uh, far in advance of the government's position, and the government has every now and then to acknowledge that in order at least to mislead the public a little more in your terms. Yeah. Another aspect of this is who does the public blame for uh, the supposed financial crisis that is upon us? Uh, a lot of them are starting to blame the war. This says, by a wide margin, wide margin, more Americans think the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have inflated the national debt than the percentage who blame domestic spending or the tax cuts enacted in the past decade for doing the same, according to a Pew poll. The Center on Budget and Policy showed that the Bush-era tax cuts have been the single biggest factor in ballooning the federal deficit, but uh, the public apparently 
doesn't uh, believe that and are inclined to blame the war and uh, uh, the wars in the Middle East and we have to head that head off that understanding somehow. Of course, to call them the Bush tax cuts, you know, already, I mean, that was 10 years ago, yeah. the tax cuts, yeah. the tax structure is supported by the current administration, yes. and they every now and then try to say, well, look, we're in a box here, you know, the Bush tax cuts, man, they really got us. I mean, come on. Yeah. How long can we accept, you know, avoid this un misunderstanding? How not, did you put it, David? Not only, not accept only, this line. Yeah, not only that, I mean, I, when Obama came into office, all of a sudden, the Senate had to have a veto veto proof majority of 60 votes to pass anything. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what the exact um, re representation was in the Congress in 2001, but I don't think the yeah. Republicans had 60 yeah. members of Absolutely the Senate. Right. I'm not even sure if they can control the Senate. They may have had f 51 or 52. It, it's clear that the Democrats at that time supported the Bush tax cut. Otherwise, they could have stopped it on the same terms mm -hmm. that the, the you know, Republicans have been, quote unquote, allowed to stop whatever little bits of crumbs the, the Obama administration has, has tried to, to throw to its so-called base. And I think you're on to an important point here, Ron, that, that, that the, we're going to hear more about because the Democrats realize this is dangerous. Remember in 1992, in somewhat similar situations, not so desperate in fact, but in somewhat similar situations, um, the Democratic candidate ran uh, a, with a th an interesting third party development going on at the same time under um, the mantra from James Carville, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, and indeed, Bill Clinton was elected president with that in mind. That, that had to play to the real concerns of the electorate, the effective electorate, and that was the economy. The, the Obama people are reading the, uh, uh, the accounts of that election right now, very much afraid they're going to be caught in that thing. I think they might, and I hope they are. Uh, we... Uh, Let's see, whose turn? Uh, whose deal is it? I'll, who's got I'll, the cards? I'll make a comment. Okay. Um, uh, I noticed, um, I, I, I probably, I probably Im imagine more than is, is real, but I, I sense that there's a discomfort with the lack of, with the failure of the, 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 very, the very predictable failure of the, of the economy to recover in a way that actually generates jobs for people. Um, I think our local newspaper recognized this in a way sort of grudgingly recognizes this by printing a column the other day by Robert Reich, Absolutely. who was the Labor Department secretary under, under Clinton, mm -hmm. and a co no radical, no leftist really, but no, a indeed. competent econom economist along the lines of Paul Krugman, who, when he's not being owned by someone, is perfectly capable of calling a spade a spade. And in this column, he, he d d described the basic, the basic uh, contours of the lack of the economic uh, recovery of a of a of a sus, sus, you know, sustainable ec economic recovery that will generate that that can actually generate jobs and and dis, dis, you know distribute wealth in a way that would be um, be meaningful to people struggling right now and what i'm hoping is that that, that also indicates in the past uh, let me say that the news news gazette has published a few of my commentaries uh, on e e economic issues, and I've, I've written one recently just about the local issue and what they call the the MSA, the Metropolitan St Statistical Air Area, uh, that's defined by the Census and the Bureau of Labor Labor Statistics and so forth. And it basically the argument I made, and I wrote this before Wright wrote his other piece, but it it isn't unlike what's being written by many people, such as Dean Baker and so forth, just going to show that. There aren't more jobs. Yeah. This is and, and and so I'm hoping that they will see this uh, as as a, a as as something that would that would bring loc uh, bring it home locally, so, so 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 to speak. That even in our relatively prosperous region, this is the three county region, which includes Champaign, Iroqu or Champaign, Ford, and uh, Piatt County. Uh, uh, this relatively prosperous area, we can see that there are basically no more jobs there are and 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 importantly what i try to point out out in this article is that the economy grows people people produce more 
but the jobs stay the same. And the wealth created by the people who are working con 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 you know, continues to go to the upper 5, 10, 15, 20 percent at right. most. Right, right. And, and, and it's, look, the, the, whole bi the whole argument with the uh, Obama administration on creating jobs is conducted within such narrow limits, uh, limits that are never uh, uh, acknowledged. Um, the question is, shall the uh, Obama administration arrange to spend a good deal more money to create jobs? That's the way they talk about it. It's talked about even by the liberal economists like Paul Krugman. He does it this morning in this morning's New York Times. Now, what's actually being said here? What they're saying is, look, uh, there's a great jobs crisis in uh, the U.S. By some measures, unemployment is worse now than it was in the Great Depression in the U.S. Okay, let's create jobs. How do we do that? We give money to rich people, hoping those rich people will go out and hire somebody to do something. That's the way yeah. to make jobs. Yeah. And that's, look, this, uh, this is from the far left of the Democratic Party. <laughs> I, the, so we always say that with a giggle, uh, like Bobby Reich, uh, down to, uh, uh, you know, the standard things are being said in the uh, Republicans and the Tea Party. Now, look, during the Depression, even the uh, Roosevelt administration, which knew that it had to make some real moves to save capitalism, uh, said, we're going to have to put people to work. Uh, we need to give them jobs. Not money to rich people, so the rich people might hire them. No, no, let's give people jobs. The Works Progress Administration was a way of giving people jobs, which in fact expanded and grew down to the Second World War when uh, the U.S. involvement in war gave people jobs in defense plants, in the military, and so forth and so on, and the WPA went away. Now, obviously, employers hated the WPA, you know, because they paid decent wages. Can't have that. Uh, but there's not even been any talk of that in the current situation. There was this one story I'm um, uh, not sure about uh, recently. Uh, the uh, job gains, uh, there uh, have been uh, some instances of hiring uh, in the past couple of months, but uh, one New York paper floated this story that half of the new jobs were at McDonald's. Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what? Right, right, yeah, those are the new jobs, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, is, but is what you're saying, Carl, I mean, maybe I'm misreading Krugman and Reich and so forth. I know I'm not misreading the leftist economists who definitely do call for WPA-type programs or government-created jobs, right. but you're saying that you don't feel like Krugman and Reich and people like that are actually calling for government spending on jobs or a government stimulus, a second stimulus that would, in fact, create jobs through government government employment, or at least partially, like like the first one did. That's right. Uh, and when they say the stimulus should have been more than it was, they're certainly right. But they're not talking about different in kind. They're talking simply about more of this pouring money into corporations with the idea that they'll hire people. And in fact, corporations are sitting on a lot of cash right now yeah. because, look, it's pointless to hire someone unless he's going to make more money for you than you're paying him. And given the lack of aggregate demand, as they say in the economics department right now, because nobody has any money in the country to spend, uh, there's no, it's pointless to expand your production, uh, to, to hire more people. You're not going to make money from them. But I, th I think the economic crisis has, has driven people like Krugman a tad to the to the left, or at least ah. sort of back to their back to their Keynesian roots to a the certain extent. The problem with Krugman, though, is that he thinks there are too many constraints to do what he, he does. He won't even suggest uh, WPA because he thinks there are too many constraints out there against yeah. it, uh, yeah. and he thinks it's a matter of attitude amongst yeah. Americans and particularly American business leaders. Listen, listen to Krugman this morning in in uh, in the New York Times. Um, Far from being ready to spend more on job creation, both parties, and he means Republicans and Democrats, both parties agree that it's time to slash spending, destroying jobs in the process, with the only difference being one of degree. Now that's right, but instead of saying to the Democrats, you got to get out of this mindset mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, establish a WPA, he says, we just need a bigger stimulus of the sort you've already done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he's come out strongly against uh, the austerity thesis. It seems to be guiding uh, a lot of our economic uh, policy, but but I'm not sure what that means. Even David Brooks comes out very strongly, although I'm not sure what it amounts to, 
uh, in support of uh, more uh, education and training and so on. That we need, we need that to revive the economy. Yeah, but that's always been the way. I, you know, we say, why aren't there any jobs? Well, there's a bad mix between the talents people have and the jobs that employers want to give. That's nonsense. There is, uh, I mean, and, and the, 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 the notion that, well, if we simply provide more training or if those feckless uh, teenagers uh, re re stay in school and learn what they're supposed to in school, then there'll be a job for them when they come out. No, that's not true. That's not happening. That's not working. Uh, that's an excuse. Uh, the technical term is lie, uh, <laughs> that, that, that because American workers don't have the training, uh, they can't be put to work. The, not the, the problem. The, the technical term in e economists, and it's a little confusing, is structural un unemployment. Yep. And it yeah. doesn't mean unemployment uh, caused by, a, a prof as one would might think from a leftist point of view, uh, a structural unemployment, sort of long-term unemployment caused by a crisis in ca capitalism. It's structural unemployment. The technical use of that means that workers don't have the skills to do, right. to do the jobs that are actually there. And this is, believe it or not, seriously argued even at this point in time when millions of people who had jobs and had the skills for jobs were laid off work and can't find jobs all of a sudden right. some people will still argue exactly. that they all of a sudden don't have the skills right. and they don't get to be that's, retrained and, that, they, and they need to be retrained that's why the technical term is lie there was a, <laughs> there's a, there's a stan absolutely standard issue uh, liberal economist uh, Harvard economics faculty uh, pointed to to the Federal Reserve, uh, how did it work? Um, had a piece in the Times this week saying, uh -huh. uh, "Look, my expertise is on labor, on just the just the just the issues you were talking about, David. Yeah. My expertise is on this, and those Republicans won't let yes. me sit on this. Uh, his diamond name is Diamond, right. uh, is Stephen MIT? Diamond, yeah. MIT, not mm -hmm. Harvard, right? Um, Same thing. Uh, he was a <laughs> yeah, he, he was a serious serious scientist, in other words, <laughs> not, not not a hand waver." Yeah. Um, uh, but a perfectly traditional economist, uh, and he's saying the problem, is, and he says in this, the reason he's not being put on this board, or at least part of it, is that he's willing to expose the lie that David was just talking about. And to put a footnote on that, I got a kick this morning out of how the, the News, News Gazette in its editorializing, bashing Obama's responsibility for the economy and the, uh, the um, leaving of his job by uh, one of his main economists named Austin Goolsbee, oh, yes. that the editorialist didn't bother to spell Austin Goolsbee's name right. <laughs> 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 that, uh, that's, I don't, that says a lot of things about a lot of things. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> yeah. I just got a kick out of that. <laughs> it is uh, instructive to read the papers on occasion, yeah. remarkably enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought this morning's New York Times op-ed page with David Brooks saying what we need are some Anthony Trollope-style Victorian uh, uh, politicians. <laughs> Uh, you you got to read this stuff, but you can't make it up. You know, um, it's amazing. And then a guy that I know slightly used to teach with, uh, giving an account of how tyrants endure. Uh, he, he's saying, well, what they do is that they pay folks to uh, to suppress the people. <laughs> and uh, you know, in fact, he implies uh, that uh, you know other 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 governments can use those tools too. I wonder who he has in mind. Uh, and then finally. Uh, 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 Krugman's rule by rentiers, uh, the yeah. uh, account of why, uh, at least implicitly, Paul Krugman is not calling for a WPA. Yeah. We're running out of time. You are watching <laughs> News from Neptune. Uh, we have uh, perhaps time for one other quote from uh, a lightning lightning round. You got another, another, yes. another thing, Ron? Do you find this as hilarious as I do? U.S. is in, I, intensifying a secret campaign of Yemen airstrikes. Who is the secret from? Yeah. Uh, it was supposed to be covert or uh, yeah. secret or well, something. What are they talking about? Once again, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Now, it's not very farcical, perhaps, if you're in Yemen and being bombed by the United States. Yeah. But remember the secret bombing of Cambodia right, right. by the Nixon administration? That yeah. they did try to keep secret from the people they were really concerned yeah. about, the American people and the American Congress. Uh, it was no secret to the people in Cambodia. 
upon whom the bombs were falling. Yeah. So, but, uh, so we have here again now secret bombing of Yemen. What's astonishing to me in this is that the administration can continue to fight its imperial wars uh, and there's not even a bit of hesitation about uh, the fact that it's manifestly illegal, unconstitutional, uh, but hey, we don't worry about that Madisonian constitution anymore, uh, so why bother? Um, this says the extent of America's war in Yemen has been among the Obama administration's most closely guarded secrets. <laughs> yeah. As, As you officials say, from whom? worried that news of unilateral American operations could undermine Mr. Saleh's tenuous grip on power. So. David, do you have a, a last round? I'll, 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 I'll defer to you if you have anything on your list there. Um, um, this is... Uh, um, we part of our remit is uh, the, co uh, the, the the coverage of the news by the media, and this is a note about the corruption of U.S. media in war reporting. Now the Yemen is bad enough. Uh, this is from a Reuters article on Obama's escalation of the war in Yemen, uh, but it's a further development, it seems to me. Um, Reuters, we sometimes think, uh, is exempt from the uh, control, the political control of the American media that we've come to know and love so well, because after all, they're foreign, aren't they? Isn't that Dutch or German or something? Well, the answer is no. Reuters is now, just as another corporation, largely owned by Canadian capital, but uh, its headquarters are in New York. We're dealing with the same sort of media that we've come to know and love so well elsewhere. Now, um, uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is a report from Reuters last week. Quote, a U.S. official confirmed to Reuters that a U.S. strike last Friday killed Abu Ali Ahareti, a mid-level al-Qaeda operative, which followed last month's attempted strike against Anwar al-Awlaki, the leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Close quote. Now the question is, yes, who is Anwar al-Awlaki? Whether al-Awlaki has any operational role in al-Qaeda at all is a matter of intense controversy. The U.S. government has repeatedly asserted that he does, but has presented no vo verifiable evidence to support that, that accusation. What is not in dispute is the notion that al-Awlaki is the leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. In other words, that's not part of, according to Reuters, that's not part of the dispute. He unquestionably is not and never has been, as multiple Yemen experts have repeatedly noted. But he's got another claim to fame. The Reuters claim is factually and entirely false, but the problem is he's an American citizen whom the Obama administration has marked out for death. Obama's assassination program targeting U.S. citizens without due process obviously raises extraordinarily, extraordinary and vitally important questions. As the New York Times put it when confirming Olaki's inclusion in Obama's hit list, quote, the Obama administration has taken the extraordinary step of authorizing the targeted killing of an American citizen. It is extremely rare, if not unprecedented, for an American to be approved for targeted killing, officials said. No, what's rare is for it to come out, for yeah. us to admit it, to say so. Yeah. We've been doing it for years. Read about what the CIA does for business. Given that, one would think that media outlets would be interested in covering the weighty issue raised by this assassination program. Here, though, we have Reuters doing exactly the opposite. They're ending the debate before it ever begins by reporting falsely that Olaki is the leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That's American propaganda. If it really were that, uh, then he might, you, might get your, you might get what the Obama administration wants, that is, an acceptance of this targeting of an American citizen for assassination. So instead of raising vital questions about Obama's extraordinary conduct, Reuters suffocates those questions by disseminating false fear-mongering propaganda on behalf of the U.S. government, the guys from al-Qaeda, to justify what the administration is doing. Overwhelmingly, that's what the role and function of the establishment media is. This isn't the most significant or notable example ever. For the contrary, it's depressingly common. The U.S. media subserviently disseminates and amplifies government propaganda, the very antithesis of what they claim to do and were intended to do. Most of that's from Glenn Greenwald, but it was Reuters that was the uh, subject of it, and it seems to me that that shows the media universe uh, that we find ourselves in as we try to report on the Americans' foreign wars. Closing comments, gentlemen. Um, I, I, well, I, I would just I would be, be remiss if I, in subsequent to what Carl just said, 
uh, oh yeah, the uh, comments didn't, on that. didn't remind uh, the didn't didn't say something about the New York Times reporting on the murder of the of the Palestinian um, uh, the Syria the Palestinians approaching yes. what is still Syria, what oh, is right. occupied Syria, and uh, and the use of the term. Um, drawing fire, that yeah. unarmed Palestinians approaching the Golan Heights, which is occupied by Israel but is still a part of Syria, um, uh, uh, a couple of dozen right. were killed by by Israeli uh, troops, and the New York Times, in the most blatant and horrible way, went out of its way not to ascribe the proper res res you know, responsibility for that, and instead to contract and, and instead to sort of blatantly contrasted to the fact of the Syrian government killing quote unquote its its right. its its uh, its own people. Yes, exactly. You've been watching News from Neptune on Urbana Public Television for the second week of June 2011. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky. This has been the lightning round edition. I think it's been fun. I think we, yeah. we got something here. Uh, if our program interested you, you might want to look at these programs heard regularly throughout each week on UPTV, White House Chronicle, Sundays at 7 a.m., repeated Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Democracy Now!, every day of the week at 7 a.m. And you see what Dublon Tondra, Amy Goodman's into this week. Uh, three, The Big Picture with Tom Hart. Weekdays at 8 a.m. Four, Labor's Worldview with our friends Dave Johnson and Jim Iman, Sundays at 4 p.m. Five, The David Pakman Show, Saturdays at 7 a.m., repeated through the week. Six, Essential Descent, Sunday, June, uh, on Sundays at 2.30, uh, on Sunday, June 12th, this coming Sunday, um, an uh, important uh, f uh, panel from the Left Forum in New York in March uh, on the Tea Party and the media. Uh, this is an important question, and this uh, Left Forum is an interesting place that not much reported elsewhere. I'm delighted UPTV is doing it. Uh, the same series, Essential Descent, also appears Thursdays at 1.30 in the afternoon. On June 16th, it will be part one of an evening with Noam Chomsky. So, uh, I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Zoke and David Green. This and other editions of this program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I can be reached at Carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook, and I'm delighted to receive your comments. We've gotten a good number on the ones that uh, programs that have recently been posted to Facebook. Uh, our thanks to our director, Jason Liggett. Uh, inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies and a good night to you.